So we're going to switch gears a little bit. We were talking about hurricanes um, and uh, we need to get on to volcanoes now. Um, now volcanoes, so we're sort of transitioning from what are uh, much more frequent or at least here in California, more ubiquitous uh, and, and, in, and in coastal areas, more ubiquitous um, uh, disasters, hurricanes, floods, um, these types of things. Now we're transitioning to something that um, is a bit of a different beast. So let's talk about volcanoes and volcanic activity. Um, let's advance, there we go. So obviously we all know what a volcano is. A volcano is some type of, of rupture or opening on the surface of the earth through which stuff comes out. Classically, it's melted rock, it's molten rock, um, as we see here from uh, Hawaii. Um, but it could also be gas, it could also be ash, other things that are coming from essentially down deep inside the earth. Um, and that through this, this fissure have been allowed to come into contact with us in the atmosphere, et cetera. We also classically think of volcano, when we say volcano, um, the other thing we tend to think of is the legacy of that surface contact. And so most typically that would be in the shape of uh, a conical mountain type of thing, right? So, so volcano is both the, the spewing of the material and also the remnant of that material uh, after the fact, potentially uh, thousands, millions of years, or even potentially billions of years uh, after the event. Um, uh, we, we've heard of some famous uh, volcanoes, or at least in our, in our conceptualization, there's some famous volcanoes. So this is Vesuvius in Italy, um, super important volcano in terms of literature and a lot of um, um, art in the Western world. In this, ca this case, this is a, a painting, um, uh, you know, again, like wildfires, um, uh, when the event isn't happening, volcanoes kind of boring, not particularly interesting. But when the event unfolds, very dramatic, very visceral, very scary um, in all senses of the word, smell, hearing, vision, uh, 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 of feeling, just, you know, vibrations, all kinds of stuff. Um, so in the case of uh, Vesuvius, it's erupted uh, 30, well, it's erupted many, many times, um, most famously in 79 AD. Um, uh, that's the one that uh, is, if you guys travel to Italy and go to any of the museums in Pompeii or, or area around there, um, that you'll, you'll see, and, and, and perhaps you've seen some of the nature documentaries or the um, uh, sort of Nova specials types of, you know, uh, uh, science programs where we see all the people preserved. Um, those actually aren't people, those are the, uh, just like when we get the fossilized remains of a dinosaur, we're not actually seeing the dinosaur in most cases, we're seeing the uh, mineralization, the, the, the sort of shadow, if you will, of the organism. Same thing here with all those folks that died in Pompeii, um, we are seeing the, um, mostly their bodies were burnt up and, and, and or obliterated in some way by the pyroclastic flows or the heat or what have you and we are seeing the remnants. And so mostly what folks have seen are the, um, are things like castings of the spaces where the person was, the debris comes on top of them, burns them up. And then when they were rediscovered um, a few hundred years ago, uh, uh, folks pull, poured in plaster and recreated those shapes, um, et cetera. Anyway, um, Vesuvius 79 ID, unknown how many people killed, at least a thousand, possibly many more. It's hard to know. We didn't have, a lot of the records have been destroyed from then. But around the, this volcano in Italy, um, there were various Roman cities. Essentially everybody died. This, this eruption played out over, uh, primary eruption over about two days. So there was some warning and some folks tried to escape, most folks weren't able to escape. So what we know about the, the direct observations that we know about this particular disaster um, uh, came when Pliny the Elder uh, 
told Pliny the, Pliny the Younger to get the hell out. And, and Pliny the Younger took off. And so uh, years later, um, a historian, a Roman historian wrote to Pliny and said, hey, so you were there, I think, when this happened. What's up? And so, so he penned uh, a narrative of what he experienced, and um, it includes many classic things. So there's some initial signs with, uh, it is possible to have a volcano that all of a sudden, just boom, goes off, uh, particularly back in the day. Not really any longer will that happen, but um, and we'll talk about that. But, um, but back in the day, you know, hey, oh, there's some weird, there's some birds flying, and oh, there's some smoke on the mountain. Um, and so, so a little bit of sense of something, but people not understanding the risk of the, of the potential threat. And, and so just kind of kept going about their lives or, or moved slowly or, uh, you know, sent their slaves to go figure out what's going on, that type of thing. Um, and as a consequence, many folks died. They died, um, uh, as we see in some disasters, with we just talked about Hurricane Katrina, um, some people just died in their homes, but many people were attempting to escape. So in some areas where we have, um, where, the, where the bodies have been um, observed, particularly in the coastal zones, so it looked like a lot of people went down to, the, to the, the beach to try to get on boats to evacuate type of thing. In some cases, people are packed three bodies per square meter. So people were clearly probably trying to run, escape, you know, uh, 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 get on boats or get on some sort of escape vessel. Uh, and that's when um, uh, the final death knell comes. Um, as, I, as I said here, since that most famous eruption in 79 AD, um, we've seen at least 31 eruptions um, since then, the most recent of which was in 1944. So this is an ongoing phenomenon. So these volcanoes um, aren't just necessarily a one and done thing. They're often um, a weak spot of an area where the deeper earth approaches the surface. And that doesn't just go away because we have a, a little bit of release of pressure at one point in time. Um, we currently have about 3 million people living in and around Vesuvius. It's considered one of the most dangerous hurricane or one of the most uh, potentially impactful hurricanes to this day. So there's about 3 million people near it, and of people in the immediate uh, 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 impact zone where, where flows could impact them, et cetera, we're talking about 600,000 people. Um, and that's, I believe, residents. That's not tourists that come through. So, so Vesuvius, classic example. So that's one example of a, of a volcano. Another example you guys may have heard of is Krakatoa. This is in, um, in the Sumatran Straits in, in Indonesia. And the most famous eruption is in 1883, huge, huge eruption. So people reported hearing this um, in Australia, in you know, you know, far away places. So on the order of almost 5,000 kilometers away, um, um, huge. The, the island itself was either um, outright blown away or, or uh, the landform crumbled into the crater. Um, so most of this island was was nuked. Um, since then, and uh, because the lava is continuing to burble, the magma is continuing to do its deal. Um, we now have a little Krakatoa that that is formed, and uh, that was responsible most recently for for example um, uh, for a twenty a twenty eighteen tsunami um, that that propagated away from that uh, location. In the eruption of 1883, large number of folks killed, at least 36,000 and possibly a lot more. Again, back in the day, hard to get exact numbers and we get into estimates, but, but on the order of many tens of thousands absolutely killed. Um, Krakatoa is also interesting because it really points to the potential global nature of, uh, of um, volcanoes. We've seen this with Mount Pinatubo and others since, but this was really the first one where we really recognized or began to recognize the influence that large eruptions can have on climate and therefore on areas far distant from the actual uh, event, unlike say a hurricane or even a wildfire or something of that nature. 
Um, the mechanism of action for the Krakatoa, the, the, or, or one of the main mechanisms of action for this larger scale impact beyond Indonesia, was this massive release of these volcanic gases, most classically sulfur dioxide. Um, and because these things are so strong, it's not just like a, a wildfire that might release the material into the air. Occasionally, when we have these really, 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 really intense wildfires, we can get such a concentration of smoke, and if the wind conditions are right, we can get that smoke going super, super high into the atmosphere. But with these strong uh, volcanoes, you can get that much more easily because the material is actually, you know, literally jetted into the into the atmosphere. And so we get this um, sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere very high up, so high up that it, at least in the northern hemisphere, it lowers temperatures in North America, in Europe, all over the place by about half a degree Celsius or so, uh, or, or close to a degree Fahrenheit. That's a huge impact when we think about the whole planet. In addition, there's a whole list. We could probably have a whole lecture just on the global knock-on effects of this, but just to highlight a few by way of introduction, um, this led to very intense, for a long period of time, very red sunsets to the point where you're seeing some folks, again, on different continents, look up and think there's a fire over the horizon because it's so red, inspiring lots of artists to do really intense uh, blood red, deep orange um, um, sunsets. So just like where we, where we go to a very smoggy area, or perhaps you guys have seen this in the wake of some of our wildfires, really uh, one of the knock-on effects, really you know, beautiful, intense, uh, 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 unusually colored sunsets. We get that around the planet. And then uh, another little no interesting knock-on effect is that this helps us, um, it, it, some very detailed observation of some of the um, gases, uh, 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 fine particles, smoke, if you will, it's not smoke, but it kind of might appear to be smoke, um, helps people first really quantify the jet stream. The, the atmospheric river of air blasting along um, in the Northern hemisphere. So, so hugely important, um, both obviously to the, to the folks in and around Indonesia, but also all kinds of consequences around the planet. The volcano I most typically think of that, that had a big impact for me is I had my 10th birthday and then a couple of days later, um, Boom, this thing happened, Mount St. Helens. <clears throat> this is a volcano uh, near Portland. It's in the state of Washington, but it's in the extreme southern part of the state of Washington, near, um, uh, close to Portland. And this sucker blew, ba boom. And this is a picture of the eruption. Uh, it happened in 1980. Uh, 57 people were killed outright. Um, and now this wasn't like Indonesia, this wasn't, excuse me, like Krakatoa, where we had, you know, people 4,000, 5,000 kilometers away um, getting, uh, hearing it. But nevertheless, the impacts, the direct impacts, messing up rail lines, roads, et cetera, extended, you know, at least on the order of 300 kilometers or so. And it's perhaps most important in terms of its legacy for becoming a key laboratory for looking at ecological disturbance uh, and ecological succession for how things come back. Um, uh, so <clears throat> as with many things, when we have these disasters, you'll get some people uh, pontificating, pontificating, not the right word, some people um, predicting that, oh my God, it's gonna take us, as we saw with New Orleans, it's gonna take us six months to pump the city out. We get it done in a few weeks. Um, oh my God, it's gonna take us decades to recover, uh, and sometimes it does, but all, much more commonly people come back and, and the system recovers sooner. The same in this case. So people were saying, oh my God, it, sh it just nuked this whole area. Everything is gone forever. Not really. Um, uh, spiders begin parachuting. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but when, when spiders are, um, are dispersing, we typically think of spiders as crawling, walking critters. With spiders, um, when they want to disperse, uh, certain species can actually essentially spin instead of a web from from uh, you know tree to tree or from or from grass blade to grass blade. They can actually 
generate a parachute and that parachute or balloon, if you will, and those spiders can balloon to a new area. So they can disperse with the wind. And we actually saw um, within uh, a few hours of the, of the main cessation of the impacts, actually the evidence of spiders beginning to, to recolonize the, the hillsides of Main, Mount St. Helens. So this becomes a huge laboratory for looking at the recovery from disasters uh, of all types, not just necessarily natural, but just when you, when you nuke a landscape, how do things come back? And uh, as a measure of how important this one eruption in 1980 has been, or, or, or the consequences of this one eruption, more than half of all the papers looking at the ecological consequences of, her, of volcanoes throughout human history come from Mount St. Helens. So a huge amount of learning is going on there, um, all kinds of interesting stuff. A lot of stuff has come back. Other things like the mountain goats and things of that nature have not because some things just, just got whacked. But, but we're able to look at um, what comes back, what doesn't come back, how, and then more importantly, the rate at which things come back. So that's Mount St. Helens. Okay, so that's a little bit of a few of the, uh, maybe the, in, your, in your head, maybe the, some of the volcanoes that you think of when you conceive of volcanoes. Now, the other thing that's gonna be different about volcanoes as we start talking about these, that differs from most of the disasters we've talked about before is the amount of warning time. Now, it's important. This is from a, a National Academy of Sciences uh, publication from a couple of years ago. Let me say, this is now, this, this is, this is uh, for you, for us, the scale of warning. Again, back in the days of Vesuvius, we didn't have warning, right? We didn't have that warning. But for, um, for, uh, for us, it's, it's pretty different. So have, so have a look at these guys I've put in red here. So here, here are volcanoes. So we have Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, some tsunami. We haven't talked about tsunamis yet or earthquakes, but you know, flooding and stuff. And so basically, this is, this is the event, this middle uh, 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 center band here is the event and then this is how the event plays out how the how the how the disaster unfolds um this is the lead up to the disaster and have a look most things we have no warning or maybe a few hours right and in the case of our our meteorological events we're working very hard to have more satellites to do better computer modeling to forecast when that disturbance off of you know, off of the Saharan, the Saharan dust storm, how that turns into a hurricane, et cetera. So we're working on that. But, you know, at best, we're talking days, uh, you know, or so. Um, but with her, with uh, 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 volcanoes, excuse me, we have way more um, uh, heads up, right? And with modern monitoring tools, we can potentially have lots of, um, uh, lots of warning. The stuff that goes here into decades, that comes from geological exploration of the site and looking at historic flow, uh, historic eruptions and looking at the periodicity, the types, etc. And then as we get closer to this, um, we use a whole, a whole variety of sensors. So probably volcanoes, the best predicted disaster in our panoply of potential uh, uh, hazards um, in the modern world. Um, so again, we have this legacy of, of geological predictions. So we know that this, th this uh, site has been erupting, well, I don't know, uh, you know, on average once every hundred years or something of that nature. So we have a, a, gross, a gross contextualization of the risk. And then through a whole variety of sensors, that are now oftentimes real-time linked to uh, remote centers in places like Menlo Park in the case of the California uh, Volcano Observatory that looks at eight different regions across the state of California where we have vo uh, volcanic activity or uh, you know, Mauna Loa in Hawaii or in Alaska, whatever. And so a whole uh, uh, interesting array of tools, some of which uh, uh, super sophisticated, super precise, others less precise, but all of them pulled together to give us real-time data. And because what we're talking about here is a process from down deep in the earth that's coming up and, and meeting the surface of the earth, 
there's many telltale signals that we can monitor before the eruption. So we almost always have a good amount of warning before the eruption happens. And so that gives us time to evacuate people. That gives us time to uh, 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 move. At, so for example, one of, one of the consequences of volcanic eruptions, ash, very fine part of ash that can go, as we talked about, the explosion very high up in the atmosphere can screw up airplanes, can actually make airplanes crash, can make airplanes engines not function. So it gives us time to reroute uh, airplane traffic, uh, uh, get visitors out of the area, et cetera. And we do that through a whole host of sensors. They include things like very ultra precise uh, GPS so that we can look at the distension or the bubbling of the earth as, as, the, as pressure builds. We can look at the release of gases um, we can look at, uh, uh, because uh, volcanoes can influence uh, subsurface water flows, we can look at the compounds, chlorides and things in um, surface water, say in creeks and things of that nature, a, a huge array of sensors that give us an indication as to the activity of the potential site. And then also uh, when we're getting closer and closer to potentially catastrophic releases of materials. So our best understood, our best predicted um, natural hazard are volcanoes. Okay, so um, by way, so that was just by way of introduction. Everything cool? Any questions so far? No. Okay. Cool. So volcanic activity is directly related to tectonic activity, right? So uh, plate tectonics and things. Um, most of our volcanic activity is going to occur at or near the boundary of plates, right? So these, so these skin, these onion skin layers of rock on the outer surface of the earth. And as they, they bump and move and, and interact with each other, that's the area where we get both earthquakes as well as volcanoes. Um, what we are most typically talking about here is magma. Um, which is created. Magma is melted rock, molten rock. Lava is the same thing as magma, but when it hits the air, when it, when it hits the surface of the earth. So magma, molten rock, boom, comes to the surface, we call that lava. And then the volcanoes themselves form around some tube or some fissure that we usually refer to as a vent. Um, some examples of some of these active boundaries uh, are subduction zones, where one, one, one plate is going underneath another, or, or even two plates are going down. Mid-ocean ridges in the ocean, uh, 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 plates coming together, pushing up. And continental rift zones, where plates might be spreading from one another. Um, so here we see our, our tectonic plates, or the major tectonic plates around the world. And um, what's, illicit, what's uh, uh, highlighted in orange here uh, is the so-called ring of fire. So the Pacific ring of fire is this huge concentration of volcanoes and earthquakes um, that are being driven by the, the movement and the interaction with the Pacific plate with other plates. And so uh, we share a very common risk um, uh, profile in the context of earthquakes and volcanoes with places like Japan, right? So LA, Tokyo, um, Seattle, we, we, we have a lot of similarities in terms of how we've um, uh, come to understand risk from volca volcanic activity and how we prepare and get ready for that. So this is the so-called ring of fire because one of the things volcanoes do is put out lava and that lava can set things on fire, hence the term ring of fire. Um, and this is a look from our, uh, from the USGS. This is, um, these are, this is volcanic activity in the US. And so we see down here, we have Hawaii down here. We have Alaska, which is this huge area of activity. And then the, the West Coast of the US. And you can see, again, as we've talked about in the past, there really is this, this difference between things like wildfire, uh, 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 flooding, et cetera, from the um, Eastern US and the Western US. And so, we, and so while there absolutely are, are um, there, there can be geologic activity, volcanic activity all around, primarily 
these things are concentrated on these plate boundaries. And you see that in the very young geologically um, uh, adolescent coast of the Western US. Uh, in the, uh, so, so each of these triangles is a different volcanic um, uh, location of volcanic activity. The dark represents things basically olden days. Um, yellow represent uh, hazard and red represent stuff that's happening uh, currently or potentially happening currently. Okay, so this magma stuff that we talked about. So that's what that's when we have a, an earthquake. This, this this deep hot stuff down below is coming into the um, to our region of the world. Um, now magma most typically you'd think of this as um, as, as a as a viscous substance. So think of if you microwaved peanut butter, sort of, sort of, you know, hot peanut butter. So it 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 can flow and move, but it's not like water. Um, it, it really is this is this viscous stuff. Um, we get magma uh, from a couple different ways, um, having to do with stuff down deep that is coming close to the surface. So uh, the first is we get decompression, we, you, we can get decompression melting. That's where we reduce the pressure on the rock. And so that reduced pressure allows the heat to, to take that solid into more of a, of a, of a semi-liquid form. We see this a lot at these edges of the plates. Um, we can also get magma forming when we have different chemical compounds uh, uh, mixed with the rock, which can lower the melting point of that rock. And so, um, so you might, might be in the same location, but with the mix of these other compounds, it actually becomes more likely to, to change state. Uh, and then we can also get uh, uh, melting just when we get certain areas where we have increased proximity to heat. So reduced pressure, adding a stuff or addition of heat can all help form um, magma. Here's some examples of how uh, we can, how these, these um, structures happen. So way down deep here, we have the, um, the, the deep hot rock, right? And, uh, and that's where the magma comes from. It's gonna somehow get into the upper mantle and then up uh, even farther through the lithosphere into the crust. And uh, this can happen in a variety of ways. So we can have something like this spreading valley here, right? So we have these two plates and they're moving apart from one another. And so as, as they move apart, the relative thickness, let me see my cursor, the relative thickness of that, of that crust cap, if you will, um, uh, thins and it makes it easier for um, these, this liquid material to, to get to the surface. Um, we can also have um, uh, uh, ultra uh, thin areas. In fact, what we get in the mid-Atlantic Ridge is we get things that we tend to refer to as hot spots. So this, this area that appears to be, um, uh, okay, so, so, so this example here is um, as these two plates move, around, move apart from each other, they're making a thinning. We also get this phenomenon of um, so-called hot spots. So we can get, uh, for reasons that I don't fully understand, I don't know if I don't know if we fully understand the geophysics of it, um, but it may well be that some of our volcanologist experts do. Um, but we have what's often referred to as sort of a weak spot um, on in the the subsurface layers of the Earth, and as the plate moves moves towards that surface, that that fountain just keeps blasting and essentially blasts a hole through the tectonic plate. And, and so as the plate moves around, this one particular uh, hot spot stays in place. So as the plate moves, we get the volcanoes just you know, seeming to shift, but in fact, the weak spot is staying in place. That's the phenomenon that we see in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, uh, yeah, and so on and so forth. And then we can get, again, if we, we can get, if we have a subduction zone, we can get, when one of the plates goes down, we can get uh, similarly uh, magma generated that can then breach and go to the surface. We have a, a few different types of, uh, making sense so far? Questions? No, okay. 
Um, all right, so we have a few different types of volcanoes and there are many finer scale uh, um, uh, cutting of volcanoes into different categorizations of volcanoes into different types. But these are, the, uh, these are some of the main ones. Uh, cinder cone, composite, shield, and lava dome. So these are, uh, if we talk about a cinder cone here, this would be a classic volcano looking, um, uh, like the kind of thing that, that a, a first grader would draw, like what's a volcano? Um, so we have a chamber down here and we have one central vent through which uh, the magma and then lava uh, uh, goes, right? And so this actual structure, right, this brown and and, and striped structure is the result of historic volcanic activity. So it's it's gone up and then chilled and then gone up and then chilled and then gone up and then chilled over the millennia and it's built up this cylinder, right? And so because it is um, but a single central vent, we get this much more, you know, sort of triangular uh, uh, shaped um, uh, geological feature. Composite is, is similar, but instead of having the, oh, I should also say that, so, okay, so, so the area in the top that's opened up, the, 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 the cap, we refer to that as the crater, right? The pool where stuff accumulates and, and or the, where the top of the mountain is blown off, that's the crater, the depressional area where uh, magma is gonna come out and or build up in. Okay, uh, so then a composite volcano has that central vent, but in addition, there's, there's side channels or there's side vents where um, the lava can get out. Um, still primarily that classic triangular shaped mountain, but uh, 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 more, more wide uh, oftentimes because of these uh, side vents. A shield volcano similarly has a, a, a one central vent, um, but also has a side vent. It does not um, it, it doesn't make as tall a volcano. So it's more of a um, sort of abalone shell uh, uh, type of mountain. And then uh, lava dome, which is another, uh, yeah. So this is one of the ones that we start to get in a different, different you know, how finally we're gonna hash this out. But lava dome is um, uh, one that is uh, small and early in development. Um, if we look at the danger, let's go back here. So if we look at the danger, this guy has been going off a lot. Yeah, you guys with me? It's been going off a lot and it's been building up over time. Two, 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 two. Central vent, pretty well defined. Okay, this is how we're gonna do the deal, right? This is where our lava is gonna go. Um, as we start going from that, uh, that sort of main type up to this dome, where the dome doesn't necessarily have a main um, area where the magma is constantly channeled to, those are the ones that are potentially the most problematic. Because as they blow, you can imagine here, if we have a, if you have a little weak side on your tire, that's probably where the air is going to come out. It's probably going to and you're going to get a um, flat tire. Here, the, the pressure is building up, building up, building up, and maybe the tire is intact, you could imagine. So the pressure is going to get much bigger. And it's, it's only gonna pop when the whole thing ruptures and the whole, you lose the tire on the freeway type of thing. So, so dome volcanoes tend to be the, um, the uh, most problematic on the surface. They tend to be the coolest until they actually blow. But these, these, uh, these types of volcanoes are really problematic. And there's a couple of different examples here, but um, a shield volcano, this one here down here, Shield is uh, the classic uh, Hawaiian there, volcano, so Mauna Loa. Um, and uh, what do I want to say? Uh, a volcanic dome a volcano, this kind right here, right? Which again is potentially the, on average, one of the most dangerous. This um, is our uh, most recent problematic eruption in California, Mount Lassen, that blew up in, starting in 1914. We actually have um, film of that. Um, it 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 continues. Oh, actually, the other thing I shouldn't mention. I don't know if I mentioned this before by way of introduction. That that 
this explosion can be ba-boom and done, but it can also be ba-boom and keep ba-booming for a long period of time. So we do have eruptions that happen essentially discreetly. And then we have eruptions that can spin out for years or decades. So our current, our current, um, our current eruption in Volcanoes National Park in Hawaii started in 1983, and it's it's still going on. So um, you know th these eruptions uh, can go on for decades um, at a time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about. Uh, these shield volcanoes. These are these tend to be the largest overall in the world. So examples of shield volcanoes, uh, again, uh, the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, we also see these, oh, I should show, let's see, let's see if I can look at this. Uh, let's see if I can look at this. As I mentioned that. Let's do Iceland. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, cool. So this is uh, in Iceland right now, real time. So uh, we have these really cool, uh, I guess it's snowing or I guess a little bit of ash. I can't tell what that is in front of the screen. Um, so this is real time right now um, and we can see uh, uh, because of these observatories, because we have all these wonderful instruments on these um, volcanoes or, or areas of volcanic activity of concern, um, where we do have active lava flows, um, since you're putting all this other instrumentation about uh, uh, elevational changes, gas sensors, etc., people also, starting a few years ago, started slapping on webcams. And so there's some pretty cool uh, web cameras out there. We can also look for, um, oh wait, this is, this is the same one. Uh, let's see if we can see. Yeah, I don't know, for some reason I, let's see. Oh, this, this is going to be an archive one. Anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, so we can see places like that, that Iceland uh, stream um, uh, are, pretty, are pretty cool to, um, to watch. Uh, so um, these shield volcanoes tend to have um, uh, low viscosity, meaning they don't, um, they don't flow as easily. Um, and they tend to not have as explosive eruptions. Um, and most of what we see, the remnants are built of lava. We can get other materials too, like ash, uh, uh, pyroclastic flows, things of this nature, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, but, but most of what we see in terms of the remnant shield, the, the remnant, uh, excuse me, the remnant volcano that we see, the rock that we see is built up directly from the uh, lava. And these are also places where we classically can get lava tubes. And so if you guys ever have the chance, has anybody actually been to Volcanoes National Park in, in, in Hawaii? No. So it's a cool place. It's a cool place. If you guys ever get the chances on the big island of Hawaii, I strongly encourage you guys uh, to go. Um, when I was a naturalist on a cruise ship um, previously, um, we we would do a cruise around the big island and uh, I'd talk about whales, but then it was also really cool to watch the lava pouring into the ocean. Another really, really cool thing, if you ever get the opportunity to see sort of the formation of land meet the ocean, really, really awesome. Um, but one of the neat things you can do uh, when you go to some of these um, uh, obviously not the not 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 the uh, currently flowing lava tubes. You don't want to be in there. But but in some of these um, the more extinct parts, the older parts, you can actually go in and walk through these these lava tubes. Really really cool. What these lava tube structures are <clears throat> are tubes where the magma was flowing right uh, through solid rock basically, and uh, so they flowed 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 flowed, and then they eventually. Uh, uh, started to slow down 
And so uh, 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 the level drops and you get um, essentially a straw, if you will, a remnant straw. Uh, and um, they can be huge. They can be really big and they're, they're pretty cool to walk through. So if you guys ever do get the chance to go check out um, volcano. There's also some cool volcanoes in the um, American Southwest uh, and others, but but uh, uh, yeah, I, I walk through lava tubes is really really cool. Um, and so here we see an example of one of these shield volcanoes, and it's it's a it's a classic, very broad, uh, you know, more of a more of a um, abalone shaped structure. And here's some of those lava tubes. So here's so here is a lava tube that or essentially a magma flowing, this guy is walking on uh, the solidified rock and this little uh, 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 window has collapsed. And so, so this lava is moving all underneath this guy. So it's starting over here, it's going all the way here, it's going in the uh, to the foreground of the picture, but there's been this collapse of this one section of the crust so you can see it flowing through. Once this all ends and cools down and everything, and you go into it, they really are these these columnar, these these tubular structures, and they really are pretty um, pretty awesome. If you ever get a chance to go hiking in one, okay, that was shield volcano, composite volcanoes happen where the magma is uh, more viscous and uh, has more potential explosion potential. Um, uh, these guys produce both lava flows and pyroclastic flows. These pyroclastic uh, flows and deposits are um, uh, uh, all kinds of other stuff, uh, rocks, uh, dust, ash, etc. We also call composite volcanoes uh, stratovolcanoes. And these are, these are on average more dangerous than the, the last example. Examples include um, Mount St. Helens and, uh, and uh, Mount Rainier, but, but the ones we've, we've mentioned so far, Mount St. Helens was a composite volcano. So here we go. So here's one of these um, classic, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like the shield volcano. It's, it's a bit more of the triangular geometry. Um, and uh, we can also get dome volcanoes. And these are really potentially explosive. So Lassen Peak in California, Mono Crater too, but, but Lassen Peak is, is an example of one of these. Um, and then cinder cone volcanoes um, are, uh, tend to be much smaller on average. And we have some, several of these in places like um, Mexico. And I think uh, the, the remnants of some of these cinder cone volcanoes, you can see if you go up to uh, Cal, the Cal Poly area, the seven sisters. Um, and so this is what these guys can look like. Much more, uh, uh, we have the, the um, uh, opening up here, the crater, and they're, they're, they tend to be much smaller in scale, as I mentioned. Okay, so volcanoes. Uh, what, what are, the, what are the, the key aspects of these volcanic geological structures? We have craters, which again is that, is, is the this part, right, is the, is the depression where um, either the top is blown off or the top slumps in as the explosion happens. And these are often on the order of, a, of half a kilometer to a few kilometers in diameter. Calderas are really large. And so this happens when you see a, a whole entire collapse or, or virtually the entire collapse of the cone. And these can be really big, you know, tens of kilometers. Um, and and uh, yeah, so they're just, just quite extensive. Um, vents are, again, the rupture or the fissure um, through which uh, lava comes to the surface. Um, and these can, be, these can be sort of circular like this. So a vent would be somewhere down around here, let's say if we had one. Um, they can be somewhat circular or they can be more like um, a crack in the, in the uh, surface. And so uh, the other, some other cool things, how are we doing on time? Almost time for a break. Um, okay, so the other uh, key things that we should note have to do with um, uh, other things. So uh, one of the most, I think, one of the hardest things for our folks working on our um, case studies has been California volcanoes, right? Because, uh, well, well, 
um, uh, Ventura County volcanoes, right? Th those folks sort of, it's hard to figure out um, examples of those. But there's all kinds of volcanic activity short of an actual volcano that we can see around. And we see those things in, for example, Ventura County and all around the Western US, all around the Ring of Fire. And so most conspicuously, these include things like hot springs, right? So areas where we go and there's water flowing or water is pooled and the water is warm or indeed really hot, right? So these are, these are historically places where folks locate um, tourist facilities or recreational facilities or some type of, um, you know, spas or, or recuperative areas. And so uh, this is area where we have some of this subsurface heating and because of cracks in the geology, um, water uh, uh, gets down, water is in proximity to that heat and gets brought to the surface. Oftentimes, in addition to the, um, the just there's the warm water, you get additional features. So sometimes these will be like sort of soda springs or, or other um, uh, features of the water because of the mixing with the minerals, et cetera, and the cooking down deep. Um, so hot springs are, are really cool things. Um, they can be cool things for animals. They can be cool things for humans. We can get geysers, which a geyser is where, so a, um, a hot spring is where we just sort of have this water kind of coming, kind of going in, going out every day. Geysers are where the water um, gets to the point where it actually boils and becomes steam and and erupts and so um geysers aren't exactly um recreational <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why we located yellowstone national park where we did um to memorialize the the beauty of the of that area and the guy including the geysers like most famously old faithful um but also geysers are key places where uh, we can, and I suppose hot springs too, but, but, but geysers more signal hotter water. Oftentimes in these um, volcanic field areas are where we locate geothermal plants. So we're, where we've put in um, structures to convert that heat to mechanical energy that then in turn gets converted to electricity and therefore uh, powers various, um, energy grids. Um, why don't we, uh, since it's, it's, uh, we're on the hour now, why don't we take our, our 10 minute break right now? And uh, so I got 9.02, we'll come back in uh, at 9.12. Cool. And oh, actually first let me ask, any questions about that stuff so far? Okay, so let's take our break and we'll come back at 9.12, you guys. Okay, everybody, let's uh, let's take a look at where we go. So let's let's keep going. And finish up our our chat about volcanoes. Um, uh, call, uh, another type of eruption that's um, partic particularly problematic are, are caldera eruptions. So we talked about those. Um, we have a sort of defined um, magma tube and sort of the classic the classic uh, triangular volcanoes, those tend to be the least problematic because they have that, that uh, you know, exit point, that weak point where the, the magma and then lava can, can erupt. Um, and then those shield volcanoes is also is more problematic. Um, caldera would be um, even more problematic because we don't tend to have them very often and they're basically, uh, you can it's sort of like a shield volcano with the stuff sort of jammed down on top, right? So again, no clear path. So it allows the pressures to build up and potentially have huge um, eruptions. Um, these are the things that you'll hear about. Uh, are mm -hmm. we supposed to see your screen? Oh, sorry, you guys can't see it. My God, thank yeah. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my God, what a, what a lame dude I am. Okay, how about that? You guys see? You guys see now? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, okay. So, so these caldera eruptions, again, really problematic. 
these are the things that uh, folks in the media or uh, how do I say this? Uh, when, when people are trying to sensationalize the importance of volcanoes, I don't know why you'd want to sensationalize them. They're already pretty crazy, but um, people refer to these as super volcanoes sometimes. And these are these sort of big, huge things um, that, you know, can blow up and, and, you know, nuclear bomb type of type of problematic things. Um, most recently here in California, we had one of those um, about 700 million years ago in Long Valley near what we're, we currently um, refer to as Mono Lake uh, in, in that area, sort of Eastern, Eastern Sierras. Uh, and that was a, a huge explosion. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm not really gonna talk about those because they're not really gonna happen that often. Um, but again, the, the range of volcanoes that we tend to see um, are gonna vary depending on where we're talking about. Again, here we have, for example, um, a mid-oceanic ridge. Uh, here we have um, a trench. And so we have this plate going, so sorry, this is, the, this is a, a cartoon version of um, the uh, sort of Pacific, if you will. Uh, we have a plate going underneath another and leading to uh, rocks uh, melting and uh, getting these sort of large, chains of volcanoes, those are our mountain ranges, right? Those are the Sierras, et cetera. And then we have things like uh, uh, these hot spots, these, these areas, the, these thin areas of the earth uh, of where the mantle is thin and where it gets close to the surface. Um, so again, mid-ocean ridges, continental rifts, subduction zones, et cetera. Most of the lava delivered to the surface of the earth is coming from these giant ridges um, along the um, bottoms of the oceans of the world. That's where most of our lava uh, comes to the surface. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this stuff is more geology that I don't think we need to focus too much on, um, but subduction zones like right here, these are really common um, around the Pacific Rim. Again, the ring of fire. Um, yeah, forget that. Okay, so uh, uh, the other ones that are uh, classic for us in the U.S. would be the Hawaiian Island chains. Again, those hot spots um, where uh, the plate is moving over the, the generation of heat, and um, those are key. Uh, Ring of fire, hot spots, mid-ocean ridges, rift valleys, classic rift valley would be East Africa. Those are the key things to know about. In terms of us, uh, this is um, a modern risk map for volcanoes. So this is why we don't focus hugely on volcanoes in, in this class and are much more interested in other things, um, much more or, or, uh, um We'll spend more time talking about earthquakes because these are going to be much more um, problematic for us or, and have a higher likelihood of occurrence. So the likelihood of a volcano happening in California is on the order of um, one, you know, one percent chance a year, or more typically, um, in the tenths or hundredths of a percent probability of happening in any one given year. So again, compared to flooding, wildfires, everything, it, it, they just don't compare um, in terms of the probability, particularly for down here in Southern California, right? So in this risk map, the dark. Uh, uh, hot red color is, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me sorry. Uh -huh. uh, wow, I just had a volcanic sneeze. Um, the, the hot is where we have um, the highest likelihood of all, even though they are relatively low in the relative scheme of things for volcanoes where we have the greatest probability and the highest risk. Um, the beige is lower risk and then the um, gray is fallout, so atmospheric fallout of ash. And so that's where we can get problems with air transportation <clears throat> or just other things in terms of respiratory issues and things of that nature, theoretically, based on potential wind conditions, et cetera, at the time of the explosion. So again, not particularly um, problematic for us down here. Um, overall, though, if we talk about uh, the world, we have 
volcanoes going off all the time. We just saw the, or earlier we saw the live feed from Iceland, that's real time. Um, we also have, uh, you know, activity going on in, in Hawaii. And um, in the US, that is on the order of uh, one, two, three volcano volcanoes a year. Most of those uh, outside of Hawaii, outside of the, the Mauna Loa in Hawaii, most of those are in Alaska, as you saw from that map I showed with just so many um, hot triangles uh, up there, particularly on the archipelago. Most of these are far away from people. It makes sense. If we have an area that's very active in volcanic activity, you're probably not going to put a big airport there. You're probably not going to put a, a major um, uh, economic hub there. Um, but we add up all these places that are um, uh, experiencing eruptions, not all are depopulated areas. We have on the order of half a billion people live in some proximity to volcanoes, either if not directly on the slopes, at least in these areas where we get downwind impacts from ash fall, et cetera. The primary effects when we talk about risk and we think about uh, what's the hazard of this, obviously the lava itself where you get burned up, uh, ash, the stuff coming down, uh, landing on stuff, inhalation problems, um, pyroclastic flows, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and the release of potentially toxic gases. Secondary effects are the, usually come from the accumulation of, of that material that was first let out. So most classically, we think of uh, uh, debris flows, mud flows, um, just like we see in the wake of wildfires or other destruction, when we have this debris, this debris falls out of the air or falls down the hillside or what have you, builds up in some type of dam or obstruction. And then um, either with some additional shaking, disturbance or a rain event or something of that nature, you can get um, a, a large buildup of pressure and then that can be released. And so you can get these uh, catastrophic failing of these obstructions and get the release of all this material. Um, uh, yeah, and then I also have it here, global cooling, theoretically global warming, but more, more typically we think about global cooling where we have these fine scale particles up in the atmosphere. And if we have a large enough volcanic eruption um, can actually act as indeed some people are, are proposing we do for our atmosphere to deal with uh, climate change, which is to increase the albedo of the earth, to increase the reflection of the earth's atmosphere by adding in these fine particulates that scatter and reflect radiation um, back out to space. And so therefore don't bring as much solar radiation incident to the earth. And so therefore don't bring as much heat and warming. And so therefore to counteract some of the effects of, of global warming. I'll just note that, that um, this effect of cooling the earth might have some effect on temperature, it will not affect the actual carbon. So the acidification of the oceans, et cetera, won't be changed even by uh, uh, these types of proposed geoengineering modeled after volcanic explosions that are increasingly getting attention. And again, here's the, here, here's the, here are the places we're talking about. We, just, we, we have pretty low risk here. Um, really, we're talking uh, Hawaii and primarily there, the Big Island and uh, the archipelago of Alaska, the Aleutian chain. Um, this is what this stuff looks like. You guys have all seen videos of this. So this is this pillow lava um, where it's, it's coming in, it's just cooling. And we get these, uh, while in the case of Hawaii, while the volcano has been essentially continuously erupting, you do get different um, uh, venting features. And so there, the flow of lava changes every so often. And um, where people live in and around that area, you can get uh, structures destroyed, roads um, um, made impassable, et cetera. Um, and here you see a cool, uh, a, a pretty cool picture where this lava is cooling and crusting over. Um, the other thing I want to mention that I think most folks don't fully think about or understand are pyroclastic flows. So lava, we get it, it's melted rock, it's, it's, it's orange, it's, you know, crazy hot, incinerates when it touches 
a house or trees, it you know, instantly catches those things on fire because of the temperature, um, et cetera. Um, but pyroclastic flows are also hugely problematic and a massive danger um, uh, when, an when an eruption can happen. So this is when um, this sort of a, a porous type of rock is blown in the atmosphere and crushed up. So both the, both the stones themselves can be just ejected, but also in the ejecting, they get, they get you know, frayed. Also, you can get these, um, so obsidian, right, glass you can get. Um, and when the explosion happens, that those fragments of glass or that, that molten rock that will solidify into the glass um, can break up and become very, very fine scale shards. So instead of just dust, which is problematic in and of itself, you can get sharp dust, which is what these um, shards of volcanic glass are, and they go in the air. So one, these things can uh, come up and then settle down, which are problematic in and of themselves. In the, in the main uh, upward explosion. You can also get on, um, particularly in the side of these um, mountains, on these vol vol volcanic, uh, old volcanic uh, cinders, you can get these sideway blasts. So they can actually go more laterally and shoot out much farther. Um, and so, whereas we typically think of a volcano as boom up and then the stuff coming down, when you have one of these lateral blasts, it can shoot straight out and be mu and go much farther horizontally than you otherwise would think of. Um, now, these pyroclastic flows are really, really incredibly dangerous. So they're incredibly hot. So whatever they capture um, or whatever cap is in their pathway, I should say, die, boom, gone. Um, and pyroclastic flows kill more people than anything uh, directly as a consequence of, of uh, Volcanoes. So again, we typically think of, oh, the lava is going to come down and burn me. No, it's, well, it could. But pyroclastic flows are what kill way, 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 way more people. These are essentially a hurricane force wind, the hurricane force front of molten dust and these glass shards. And it's just really, really crazy. Um, so uh, some of you might have seen some of the documentaries in the wake of 9 11 where we had the Twin Towers in New York and they were there and everybody's watching them. They're like, oh my God, this hor horrible stuff is unfolding. And, and people are staring, you know, in, in downtown Manhattan, they're sort of staring at these structures. And then when the tower falls and people are like, oh, I got to get out of here. And they turn around and start to run. And then they get this huge, right? This huge um, dust and debris cloud that is way faster than they can outrun. Imagine that coming down, usually downhill, and boiling hot and anything it touches, not just making you cough, but actually making it impossible to breathe, incinerating you, it's, it's crazy stuff. It really is um, incredibly dangerous. Um, and this is what one of these pyroclastic flows looks like. Um, so this is flowing down almost like water, but it again is this dense mixture of debris, dust, glass, and these guys are in a bad time uh, right now. Um, okay, we can also have just that, as I mentioned, pyroclastic flows, the biggest problem, we can also get ash blown up in the air and then settle down. This ash in and of itself, while might not be as directly lethal as the pyroclastic front coming down, ash can have all kinds of negative consequences, oftentimes beyond the, well, if you're caught in a, in a thick ash fall, you can suffocate, so to be sure, but more typically, ash is going to uh, uh, kill you a bit slower than the, uh, and have negative impacts on a longer time scale than the pyroclastic flows themselves. So first and foremost, vegetation, crops, et cetera, can be killed. Um, any water bodies usually nuked. So these, wa these lakes or creeks oftentimes will become more like cement, more like uh, 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 depending on the amount of ash. First and foremost, the ash will change, can change the, the chemical nature of the water, so it can make it more um, uh, basic. Uh, it, well, it could, it could do, it could, it could change the acidity in, in various ways, but but it can change the the um, 
redox potential, for example, of the water. Uh, and then just the physical structure of the particles can get in the way and clog things up. So they can clog intakes for power plants, a coolant uh, uh, intakes, things of that nature. Can, you can suffocate, can block your lungs, fish gills, uh, uh, insect uh, spiracles can get clogged, all that kind of stuff. Um, oftentimes, when we get a large amount of this, just like snow, if you guys you know travel to ski country, you know that a lot of these alpine resorts and homes and things have very steepled roofs, right? Have, have, have very straight up and down roofs. And that's so that when the snow falls, the snow sloughs off, right? You don't see a lot of flat uh, horizontal roofs up in the alpine areas because the snow would build up and just crush. Well, when a volcano happens, oftentimes it, it's not in an area that have, that have those really you know, pointy roofs. And so as a consequence, you get a lot of structural failures when you, when you get a large amount of ash depositing uh, on these uh, buildings. And then of course, uh, that ash also very fine scale, essentially the ash does not interact well with moving parts. And so just like it, it plugs your holes in your, in your um, alveoli and stuff like that in your lungs, it'll also get into the moving parts of, for example, jet engines and quickly grind everything. And it's almost like throwing sandpaper. It's literally like throwing sandpaper. It's not like throwing sandpaper, it is throwing sandpaper. It's just, there's no paper uh, into the, the gumming works of the engine. And so very quickly those engines uh, will will stall out and they won't work. And then all of a sudden you're flying an airplane that you don't have any ability to, to control your speed and you just start to, to crash. Um, hence, when we have these volcanic eruptions, we really need to pay attention to the um, air traffic. And so here's an example of, of sort of the magnitude you can get in terms of the ash deposition. So um, can be quite large, meters thick of ash deposition, depending on where we are. And then we have the, the toxic gases that are coming up with the heat and with the, the magma and other things. Uh, a whole range of stuff. I don't, I don't know all of, all of the materials, but they include things like carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxides, hydrogen sulfides, um, and associated compounds. Um, and uh, they, can, they can be problematic. Normally though, the toxicity is associated with the, the primary eruption. So normally the toxicity is associated with um, like the top of the mountain, except where we have those fissures, where we have those, some of those side vents and things that we mentioned that um, uh, aren't you know, a, a cylindrical top of the mountain, but maybe a side vent and you could, could be quite long. You can't, we do have things of, we have incidents of, for example, people grazing cattle or, or goats or something like that. And there's a, there's a activity of the, of the um, area and you can get like a, essentially a burp of <clears throat> a burp of carbon dioxide or something that can actually suffocate uh, those those animals say grazing in or around the fissure um yeah so there you go oh yeah then one other thing that you'll get we, we saw this most recently a couple of years ago in um hawaii where uh, a, a major event where you can get um this volcanic smog it's the same process as we get in urban areas when we get our smog, um, which we typically think of as being generated by the emissions of vehicles and the burnings of, of fossil fuels, et cetera, and, and oftentimes an inversion layer, so where that material is held close to the ground, and oftentimes where you have a lot of um, uh, solar radiation, so you have a lot of um, um, uh, photochemical smog generated. You can get the same phenomenon with a volcano, it's just coming from a volcano, and, and people have uh, nicknamed this VOG, which is volcanic smog. Okay, then the last uh, category of, of threats here, so lava, pyroclastic flows, ash deposits, and then the um, consequence of the buildup of all this potential material, right, um, of the, the ash, for example. So you can get uh, these guys building up, and then just like with, as we mentioned, with the um, wildfires, et cetera, you can get the, the failing of that structure, and you can get a lahar that, that flows down, again, catastrophically. Um, you can get debris flows, which uh, in places like um, 
Iceland that are actually have mixes of snow and, and ice, you can get these sort of weird uh, slushy mixes that are problematic. And we can also get mud flows when we have rain events in the wake of um, the event. So just like, just like after the disaster happens, we're really worried about the first big rains after a wildfire. Same thing after the denuded, say, volcanic hillside in the wake of the volcano, the first big winter storms, we'd be particularly concerned about mud flows in exactly uh, the same way. Um, okay, yeah, so, so here's some examples of some of these different uh, flows. And so again, this is what a volcanologist will go map. So, they'll go, so this is after the fact, right? This is some random day not necessarily associated with the disaster itself. You can go out and you can, by looking at the geology and the depositional structure of the area, you can map out, and people have mapped out the debris flows, the, the ash flows, et cetera, from places like uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, we can get landslides as well. And so this would be caused from um, uh, the, the shaking itself of the boom of the explosion of the volcano. If these are, are proximate to um, the ocean, you can actually get um, a subsurface earthquake, which can um, cause tsunamis. And so we frequently see, for example, in these um, areas around Indonesia, the volcano is paired with the initiation of a tsunami. Um, okay, yeah, okay, so I'll just say, so I'll just say that, that yeah, so there's, so, the, so volcanoes are one of these examples. We've talked about how disasters get increasingly complicated, right? As humans have, have gone into the environment, as humans have changed the environment. And so what maybe was just a storm that would have been problematic before, now that we've put a city in the area, and now that we've put, for example, a lame flood protection system around that city, the risk goes up. Um, in the case of volcanoes, volcanoes uh, are a classic example, perhaps the classic example, of a natural hazard that is a quote unquote a hazard, but has direct impact on other hazards and may induce many other events to happen. Earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, 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 mud flows, et cetera. And landslides are but one example of that. A question so far. Okay, um, we'll uh, get near the end here. We'll just talk about how we on time. So we'll just talk about um, uh, a little bit more of, of Mount St. Helens and then we'll uh, uh, sort of call it a day as we sort of get to the end of this. Um, let's talk a little bit. Again, we mentioned that Mount St. Helens uh, uh, started in or erupted in 1980, I should say. And here we are. So again, this is in Washington State. Where are we? My cursor isn't working. We're in Washington State. Uh, so here's Mount St. Helens, uh, close to Portland, the southern part of the state. Um, and it's one of the best studied cases, particularly in terms of ecology and in the ecological environmental response in uh, post, uh, post uh, eruption. So this is what the this is what it looked like before the mountain. And this is what it looked like after. So you see this huge chunk blows out and goes to um, goes to the side, essentially up into the side. Um, and this is immediately after. And you see it. We look at here. I don't know if you guys can tell on your on your pixelated zoom screen, but these are all uh, trees. Now to start the situation, um, other mountains in the area, the tree line was a bit higher, um, and so it was a little bit aberrantly low probably because of historic eruptions. And the, um, uh, the, diff, the, the newness of the soil. So the soil was <coughs> relatively young here compared to some of the other peaks. So a little bit harder for uh, trees to get established, et cetera. This is in the wake of the eruption. You see no trees. Indeed, you see no macroscopic vegetation at all. Everything has been uh, burned up or, or smothered to death. So here's the timeline. So for the, um, nothing was going on with the mountain for 120 years. Again, this is the period where Europeans settle the area. 
um, displace the native peoples, et cetera. So these folks that have moved in, um, by and large, are were, were ignorant of this. Now, the, U the United States Geological Survey, which is our government agency that tracks um, both earthquakes and um, uh, volcanoes, they had been monitoring this. So there was some heads up, but, but nevertheless, the, the properties and people's homesteads and things like that were established in this period where people didn't really um, understand this was a, a, what the probability of the risk was. And if they, even if they knew something about it, they would think most of them thought it wasn't a very high likelihood, right? Just putting up your ranch in the 1930s or something of that nature. Starting in March of 1980, we start to see increasing seismic activity in small explosions. Again, we're monitoring all of these potential uh, um, areas of eruptions all the time. And we're getting better every year in terms of additional sensors and in terms of additional modeling, et cetera. Uh, volcanologists are using a mix of, of this direct sensing of the environment the folks walking around with a, with a hammer in their hand and knocking in rocks and looking at the geological structure. So that long-term field observation and mapping of historic conditions and historic geology, uh, or I should say mapping current geology that gives us insight into history, and then doing work inside laboratories and doing um, experimentation and modeling and labs. So all that comes together um, and by 1980, it's not as sophisticated as it is now, but it was already enough that people knew something was up. Uh, one of the primary things we can sense the distension of the, of the surface, right, as this lava material builds up, uh, or I should say magma builds up before it becomes lava. Um, and that leads to, uh, so by May 1st, that bulge begins to become quite pronounced, um, particularly on the northern side of the mountain. And so it's growing on the order of, of a meter and a half a day. So in other words, uh, the, the ground is rising up, or at least on that side of the mountain is, is expanding out um, a meter and a half a day. So that's a like warning, warning, like get the hell out, get the hell out. And on the early morning of May 18th, um, we have a big um, earthquake, uh, magnitude 5.1. Uh, uh, hillside starts to crumble. And then a few seconds later, this big, huge blast from the side of the mountain, and it boom goes, and that's the, the problem. So uh, by, by an hour after the blast, this ash is very high in the stratosphere, causing problems and with, with air, air travel and starting to spread further and further. Um, within nine hours, ash is falling um, over lots of the area of the Pacific Northwest. Um, all the way to Montana, and uh, the pyroclastic flows begin to head down uh, the slope and, and uh, take out whatever is, is left. Um, we also see a lot of the, um, uh, those, that debris filling up the streams and dams and, and, um, and lakes, and those break open and lead to these mud flows uh, that are uh, that go down the hill, et cetera. So this is a diagram of, of how it happened, right? So this was a case where we didn't shoot straight out the top. Again, it, this is the northern side of the mountain. It sort of, brrr, you see this bulge happening, happening, happening. And as this is bulging, this top part is beginning to slough. And then when it blows, it just essentially takes this whole chunk of the mountain off. And so that's what you're seeing. Uh, where am I looking? So that, that's what we're seeing here. So this whole side blows. And it's like a big giant bomb went off inside. Um, and then the lateral blast continues and it goes more sideways. And then we see this material going while the gases and the ash go straight up. Um, we get the pyroclastic flows going down the uh, mountain. <clears throat> this is the eventual path of that material. So, right, so if, here's the summit. And we're talking, you know, on the order of uh, 10 or so miles, 10, 15 miles, just of the primary um, uh, tree death, right? So things are knocked down far. There's about an 800 foot elevation area where everything is nuked. Um, 
yeah okay and then um and then again the atmospheric effects tend to be the broad the widest spread effects and so this ash cloud spreads over much of the u.s over the next couple of days and goes all over the uh, new england seaboard and gets the attention of all the people in congress uh, etc so this was this was huge news this was the news of the day for quite some time this is very dramatic and in fact when i was a little boy i had a i had a um picture of the explosion on my wall it was so that i took out of like a newspaper or something it was it was pretty dramatic uh, okay so in summary with that particular volcanic eruption in southern washington in 1980 57 people were killed um hundreds of homes destroyed uh, trees were flattened across an 800 foot elevational range in that part of the um the country uh, the damages were estimated at over a billion dollars um in 1980 dollars i probably should have i need I, you know i should adjust that to, to dollars for today but but a big you know big damage this is um um quite costly for as as relatively remote and as relatively few people uh, as were impacted huge damage um and then in 2004 uh, we've we've entered this other phase where we're starting to see regrowth of the of the the um, uh, potentially working towards another eruption. Um, I'll say that there's you know we might think of where are we? Okay, so we might think of this as a rel relatively right. This isn't downtown LA or New York City or Chicago or something, but um, a lot of the impacts are uh from things we don't typically associate so for example um impacts to water distribution systems so if we have our um water supply for our city whatever comes from the mountains and the mountain reservoirs everything get clogged up with kind of made cement with um a debris that's a problem power line so we have a lot of hydropower up here in this part of the pacific northwest right some of that hydropower is shipped down to us down in California, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Um, so these power lines, these high tension power lines, this is part of an issue also with the Santa Ana winds when we talk about wildfires, most of those lines are not insulated. And so these fine particles, these ash particles um, can uh, essentially cause short circuits and arcs and sparks on the lines and cause the power lines to um, um, trigger a, a a trip warning and therefore the power grid go off. So when we have this explosion, we get impacts on things like air travel, on things like um, uh, electricity movement, et cetera, that can affect people in a much wider swath of area, not just those in the immediate vicinity. Okay, where was I? Um, yeah, okay. So this is this is a, a, a or at least last couple of years picture, and so we can see that activity that's still that's beginning to build up again, slowly building, slowly building. Is it going to erupt tomorrow? No. Is it going to erupt next week? Probably not. Right. So we have these sensors, so we'll get some warning. But might it erupt a year and a half from now? Two years from now? Possibly. Right. We don't we don't have that ability to forecast. But these sensors will really give us uh, days to weeks and possibly months of warning before uh, the next eruption. But um, um, that is Mount know, St. Helens today. Um, as we mentioned, uh, volcanoes tie into other things, earthquakes, landslides, um, uh, incineration, fire. We don't really think of fire all that often, but it potentially could happen um, and has happened. Um, and then those issues associated with climate change. In terms of ecosystem services of these volcanoes, um, the, the, <clears throat> just like with flooding, while the flooding itself is not good for crops, et cetera, um, uh, the, the consequences of flooding really good for uh, making fertile soils and the same thing for volcanic soils. So, the, so volcanic soils tend to be really good for things like pineapples, things like coffee, as I mentioned before, we can get geothermal uh, power from these volcanoes or at least volcanic fields. Um, they can bring to the surface uh, mineral resources 
um, and can be really helpful for a variety of industries. And so, uh, for example, our, some of our fissures down deep where we have some of these spreading areas in the um, uh, oceanic areas, uh, deep sea areas, um, those are places where Sawara One and some of these other uh, deep sea mining uh, proposals uh, are, are taking place, or at least were proposed and seem to be perennially proposed. And so that is to go down and get some of these um, useful mineral resources associated with the vents or associated with the eruptions. We mentioned the recreation, so we can have health spas and hot springs. Has anybody, has anybody gone up to the... Uh, hot springs up around, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas College in Ojai or on the Ventura River around Matilha. Has anybody been to any of those hot springs? No, okay, well, well, uh, now that people are beginning to get vaccinated and when you guys wanna go out and, and have a fun activity, um, you might, we have some pretty cool hot springs uh, in and around the back country in Ventura here, Ventura County. And indeed, there were historic spas and things that were built in some of these locations. Um, and so these tend to be popular places because it's fun to sit in a hot tub type of environment. Um, so uh, you want to plan your trip so that you get there not at the peak time when, when, the, when the yahoos hike in, but, but uh, I would recommend you guys at least consider at some point before you graduate going and checking some of these hot springs if you're inclined to do hiking and, and things of that nature. Um, yeah, all kinds of other recreation opportunities. The, and this is one of the few ways we get new land, right? So Hawaii is one of the places in one of the states in the US where we're actually adding land. Other areas we're talking about um, sea level rise, talking about losing land. Sea level rise is also happening in Hawaii, but the amount, the rate of creation of land is outpacing that. So, so we're, we're sort of constantly andy, adding on acreage in these um, volcanic areas, which is kind of a cool thing. And we'll just end with talking about some of the warning systems, some of the alert systems. Um, now we haven't talked much about this. I guess I should have talked about that in the hurricanes, but, but the stuff we've talked about so far really, hey, get out of here really quickly. Um, these uh, volcanic notification systems are more, there's a higher level of gradation um, because we have such a good understanding of the potential risk. And as we get closer and closer to the potential event, the potential eruption, we get, um, uh, we, we have finer precision in terms of our alerts. So alerts are broken into two uh, broad categories by the USGS. There's stuff for you and me on the ground. And then there's stuff for, for the FAA to deal with uh, high elevation air travel. And these are what those are. So we have normal advisory watches and warnings. And so these go from green, yellow, orange, red. Again, we've talked about this, or at least we, I believe we talked about this in the context of COVID, where uh, COVID we've, we've moved to purple, right? Because we were trying to figure out how to make red or red. Um, and so, so this is one of the old, the, one of the original categorizations of risk and warning with the idea, historic idea being read as the most dangerous level or the, or the level that's of most concern to us. Um, and, uh, okay. And um, so anyway, so, so, so yeah, so COVID, we, we, we got crazy and then we got even more crazy. So that's why we invented the purple, et cetera. Okay, so normal is where we normally are. Nothing's a problem, don't worry about it. Uh, advisory, we're starting to get eh, a little bit of a problem. Uh, watch is we gotta, we, we gotta get ready. There is a, a eruption building, although we're not sure when. Warning is get out right now. Um, there's, there's a problem going on. You guys can all, let me, let me toss this in the chat. Let's see, okay. So this is our California Okay, so this is our California uh, Volcano Observatory site, and you guys can uh, click on this and check this out. So this is uh, now, 
some of our observatory, so an observatory is a place where we um, pull together a collection of understanding, pull together different data streams to make things uh, uh, more obvious. We can talk about an observatory in terms of watching stars. We can talk about an observatory in terms of watching um, critters underneath the ocean. We can talk about an observatory in terms of hazards. And so in this case, this is the observatory for California. Uh, sorry, hold on one second, you guys. Give me one second here. Okay. Um, Blah, 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 sorry about that. Okay, so anyways, okay, so, so this is our observatory. So this is our, um, our, this is California, and we have uh, California broken into a couple of these different areas. Now, the, the highest hazards, as we saw, were up here in the um, uh, northern part of the state. Oh, sorry, first of all, we can say, we can look at this right now, and we can see today, uh, these things are green, right? So this is green is the normal condition, as we see right here, right? Green is normal. And uh, so this means, you know, no elevated risk. This is just the background, uh, uh, you know, day in, day out. So there's no need to, if you wanted to go to Lassen uh, or any of these other areas for, uh, you know, vacation or something, that's cool to do. Um, then we come down and we can see some of these other features. So for example, this is the area around uh, Clear Lake. And if, sorry, if we click, click on one of these guys, so this is the Clear Lake Volcanic Field. If I click on Learn More, it's going to take me at some point, if my super slow internet works, it's going to take me to the site. Um, uh, and we'll see uh, the location. We'll see more information. We can get the, the um, specifics of it. Um, and this is also an area, for example, where so this is a volcanic field. So unlike uh, you know, a caldera or a single peak. This is an area where we have geothermal um, energy production, for example. And then uh, we have, oh, this is, why is my thing rendering like this? So uh, people think of Mammoth Mountain. This is the, um, the Long Valley area. And if I click on this, yeah. So if I click on this, so this is the area around Mono Lake and it, it spills down this area. And so we have uh, several features in and around this site, but I guess when I click on it, it only shows me one. Okay, anyway, uh, so you guys can play around with this if you're, if you're so interested. Um, but I also wanted to show you guys uh, before we wrap up um, uh, an example of the last big uh, eruption that we had here in California. And this is over a hundred years ago now. But this is Mount Lassen. So Mount Lassen, um, the eruption happens, uh, primary eruption from 19, I think it was 1914 to 1917. And so this is, uh, I think, one of the oldest um, uh, film reels of an actual eruption. So again, this, is, this was, film was made in 1915. I'm going to uh, silence this because this is nothing, nothing helpful here. Um, so this is, uh, so we're Mount Lassen, we're in Northern California. This is, I think by the, it's a town Red Bluff or something, I think it's called. So here we go. So we're, so this is the, now this has been happening for some time now, right? This has been happening for many, many months at the point where the, the film crew goes up here and starts filming this. And so you see, okay, there you go. You see the crater. And uh, in a second, you're gonna see, a little more. And okay, so yeah, so here you go. Okay, so here's the eruption, right? So here we go. So this is a, here, so we're seeing, pause this for a second. Okay, so we're seeing both the eruption, the sort of the, 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 the top of the um, uh, cone, but then also we're seeing a weakening and a, one of these side channels going out. And so we're seeing this um, a lot more of a lateral blast happening as well. And this will continue to expand. And so obviously the winds are blowing uh, from the left to the right.
And so if you are in this cloud or if you're downstream from this cloud, this is bad news. At a minimum, you want to be having an N95 particle mask, ideally something even better. Um, this will clog, even if you have like a buff or a, or a handkerchief, that kind of stuff that some people wear uh, in times of COVID, ain't going to do it, right? These fine particles are going to go through that. So you need something much, much uh, finer, something that people would use that if they're working on styrofoam or something of that, um, or, or doing grinding or something of that nature. And I think we're almost out. I think, yeah, we only have a couple more seconds here and then this thing is over. So, so yeah, so this is a pretty cool film um, and rare to have this documented, uh, you know, before um, the last many decades. Now we have all kinds of fantastic uh, film. We can have drones up there and, and uh, satellite images, but back in the day, uh, we did not. And so this is really valuable uh, footage from the Lassen explosion um, between 1914 and 19. 17. Okay, cool. So with that, uh, questions. Anybody have any have any questions for me about uh, volcanoes? Again, not a massive risk for us, but but in different parts of the world, significant risks and um, and a, a classic potential disaster. Classic natural hazard. Um, Professor, what is a mud volcano? Is it a type of volcano too? Um, oh, hold on, let me kill this. Let's not watch ads. Let's come back over here. Oh, okay. Um, a mud volcano. So, uh, well, so um, you can get that when you have um, essentially ash and rain. So that ash and rain will uh, form mud. So, so uh, you can get uh, things, like, I'm not sure, Ollie, what you're talking about exactly, but you can get areas um, around geysers and hot springs that are actually, um, instead of water coming up, it's a mix of water and soils or a mix of water and pumice or water and ash. And that stuff can be bubbling and can occasionally explode. But um, those are more like a, a mud field type of things. I'm not, I'm not sure when you say a mud volcano, um, we can get mud coming out of an explosion, but, but yeah, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, well, they call it, it's kind of, it kind of looks like a volcano, but um, it's just upwelling of like, it's just bubbling out mud and stuff like that. Yeah, so that's basically gonna be one of these, uh, similar to a geyser, it's just instead of it just being liquid, instead of just being water, it's got um, sediment mixed mixed in with it. So um, some of the so some of those things are also for hot. You see um, people establish hot springs, sort of spa type recreational things. If the mud is a certain level of temperature, if it's boiling hot, they don't put you in it. But but you can get some of those uh, things as well. But yeah, I think that's just a, a, a variant of a volcanic field. Okay, thank you. Other volcano questions? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so let me uh, kill this and let me kill.